I'm Ron Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm providing some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literature and cultural studies. In this installment, I'll say some things about Geoffrey Chaucer and about his long poem, The Canterbury Tales. Geoffrey Chaucer was born sometime around 1340 in London, and he died in 1400. He was the son of a successful wine merchant, a member of a rising middle class that would steadily displace the aristocracy in economic power in England over the next 300 years. Chaucer's wife was a member of the lower aristocracy, and through her, he became connected to the highest levels of the English aristocracy when her sister married John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster. John of Gaunt was the son of King Edward III, the uncle of King Richard II, and the father of King Henry IV. So John of Gaunt was an influential member of the royal family, and Chaucer must have benefited from this connection. Chaucer was well-educated. He knew Italian and Latin, as well as speaking French and English, and he had a successful career in the service of John of Gaunt and as a government bureaucrat, eventually rising to become a, a member of parliament. And he also had a position controlling the customs of the wool trade for England. Chaucer's career, in effect, illustrates the changing power relations between economic power and military force in the 14th century in England. Medieval England, the period from around 700 of the Common Era to around 1500, was a feudal society with strictly hierarchical social power relations, characterized by a kind of a pyramid structure with lots of peasants at the bottom, some merchants and craftsmen, civil service functionaries and members of religious orders in the middle, and an elite group of knights, earls, dukes, and other aristocratic ranks at the very top. Feudal societies emphasized communal relationships among people rather than the individualism that we are familiar with in the modern era. Family networks were extended rather than nuclear. Members of families depended upon each other in multi-generational networks, and networks that included cousins and distant cousins and other kinfolks as part of the network. Although the social hierarchy was very rigid with little opportunity for social mobility, there were mutual reciprocal obligations between aristocratic lords and the peasants or serfs who worked on their lands. In terms of economic production, under feudalism, the economy was rather static, not very dynamic. The largest part of economic production consisted in subsistence agriculture, the production of food crops to be consumed by the local population rather than for export. In the towns and villages, there would be small craft shop industries, but no larger scale industrial production of the kind that would come later in the modern era. What international trade that existed consisted of luxury goods, such as jewelry, tapestries, spices, and so on, that were exchanged among members of the aristocratic classes of the different regions of Europe. But this feudal order was beginning to show signs of strain, especially economically, during Chaucer's lifetime. Chaucer lived during a somewhat tumultuous period in English history. England was ruled by three different monarchs in the latter half of the 14th century. Edward III, who ruled from 1327 to 1377, built a powerful military and started a 100 years war by claiming his birthright to rule lands that he felt he was entitled to in northern France. Richard II, his grandson, was only 10 years old when his grandfather died and he became King of England. So in the first years of his reign, England was governed by a royal council. Nonetheless, England remained a force to be reckoned with in the ongoing 100 Years' War, as well as in a series of border conflicts with Scotland 
and the crown also put down a serious peasants' rebellion in 1381. In 1399, the year before Chaucer died, Richard II was deposed in a military coup led by his cousin, Henry Bolingbroke, who became King Henry IV. The fact that there was a serious challenge to the regime in the form of a peasants' rebellion in 1381 itself marks a significant and distinctive historical shift from the power relations typical of earlier centuries in the Middle Ages. The peasants' revolt was provoked by the imposition of a poll tax, which was made necessary by the government's military adventure. Edward III and Richard II were militaristic rulers, and the country was constantly at war, but economic power was beginning to challenge military power as the shaping and dynamic force of English society. The 14th century saw substantial growth in market towns with craft guild shops, a robust international trade in wool. Another somewhat unexpected boost to the economy came in the form of the Black Plague, a devastating disease that is estimated to have killed as much as one half the population of Europe in the late 1340s and 1350s. I mentioned the plague as one factor boosting the economy because, ironically, after the death of so many people, there was more wealth, more resources to share among those who survived. These changing power relations, reflecting the rise of a merchant class and the decline of a class of warrior aristocrats, can be identified in both the content and the style of Chaucer's poetry, including the Canterbury Tales. Let me take a moment to compare the Canterbury Tales to the epic poem Beowulf, which we've already been reading in this course. Beowulf is a typical heroic epic of the kind that would be sung or recited on ceremonial occasions to celebrate the heroic exploits of a great warrior. In an epic such as this, there is typically little attention to different ranks of society and little attention to relationships among people of different class status. By contrast, these relationships among people at different levels of the status hierarchy and the perspectives resulting from their different life experiences are foregrounded in the Canterbury Tales. In the epic poem Beowulf, there is one bardic voice relating the narrative, although some dramatic exchanges between characters are also presented. The Canterbury Tales, as the title suggests, is a collection of different stories, each one presented by a different speaker relating his or her own perspective. Chaucer, as the frame narrator, introduces each character to us and shapes our perceptions of them with his observations and descriptions, while the individual characters also sometimes interact directly with each other. This produces a multivocal cacophony of different perspectives, as opposed to the more or less univocal magisterial presentation of Beowulf and other epics. The Canterbury Tales employs a literary device known as the frame narrative, in which a collection of stories are assembled together in a way that develops a larger overarching theme. One of the most famous examples of this type of poem, and one that influenced Chaucer, is the Decameron, written sometime in the early 1350s by the Italian poet Giovanni Boccaccio. The Decameron consists of 100 love stories in verse, told by a group of young aristocrats who have sequestered themselves in a country house outside of Florence in an effort to avoid contracting the Black Plague. As a way to stave off boredom, they amuse themselves by telling love stories to each other. Chaucer's frame device is a road trip, a religious pilgrimage. A group of strangers happen to be lodging at the same inn, 
on the south side of the Thames on the outskirts of London, when they discover that they are all going to the same place, to Canterbury Cathedral, they decide to ride together along the way and to tell stories to each other for entertainment. This chance setting allows Chaucer to assemble a group of storytellers from different occupations, different levels of the status hierarchy, with different perspectives. Some of these characters would be quite unlikely to interact with each other in their day-to-day -day lives. Chaucer's pilgrims include some people from the lower levels of the aristocracy, such as a knight and a prioress, a lady who leads a religious monastery. He presents merchants, tradespeople, farmers, and members of the lower clergy as well. Since these characters have embarked on a religious pilgrimage, one might expect that they have some sins to repent of. Indeed, Chaucer, as the frame narrator, will reveal their imperfections, even as he presents them with a kind of faithful credulousness, often allowing the storytellers inadvertently to exhibit their own character flaws as they tell their stories. While Chaucer's pilgrims represent a broad range of English society, he doesn't include anyone from the lowest ranks, the peasantry. It would be unrealistic, in fact, practically impossible for a peasant to embark on a pilgrimage like this. And he doesn't include anyone from the highest ranks of the aristocracy. Such an aristocrat would be traveling with a private entourage and would not likely be associating with Chaucer's group. But this absence of aristocrats and courtiers is also convenient for the poet. The poem is written for circulation among relatively elite audiences. It gently mocks the foibles of all these pilgrims in ways that must be entertaining to these elite audiences. Audiences who might not take so well to seeing their own shortcomings ridiculed. Another distinctive feature of Chaucer's poem that deserves to be mentioned is that he wrote in English rather than French. Since the 11th century, when William of Normandy conquered England, French had been the daily language of the court and of the legal system in England. English continued to be spoken among the common people, but by the 14th century, when Chaucer was writing, English was becoming more commonly used among the upper classes as well. By writing in English rather than French, Chaucer was cutting himself off from a wider international audience. French is spoken elsewhere in Europe as well as England, but English was spoken by substantial numbers of people only in England. So why did he write in English? It's difficult to tell. Perhaps he had an artistic motive, and Chaucer also had the recent example of Boccaccio in the Decameron. Boccaccio had written in vernacular Italian rather than in Latin. That said, there were several different regional varieties of English being spoken in England during the 1300s. The version of English that Chaucer uses was spoken in London and the surrounding area, and it showed more French influence and more French words than the versions of English spoken in other parts of England. So Chaucer uses a lot of French words and turns of phrase, as you'll notice as we read the Canterbury Tales. The poem begins with a general prologue that introduces the setting and each character in turn. This is followed by the series of stories told by the travelers with individual prologues for some of the tales and some dramatic exchanges between characters. In this class, we'll be focusing on the general prologue and on three of the tales, the knight's tale, the miller's tale, and the wife of Bath's tale, and the prologue that goes along with her tale. I'll have more to say about each of these sections of the poem in subsequent webcasts. But for now, I'll conclude this webcast. As always, if you have questions or comments, don't hesitate to send me an email.